Okay, we'll go ahead and start our session. I first want to acknowledge that the organizer of this session was Fred Lamb, who is the program chair of this, and uh, he's been uh, putting together lots of very nice programs uh, here for the Forum of Physics and Society. And what we'll do start, uh, to start with is to have uh, Fred say a, a few words about the Physics Coalition, which is highly relevant uh, to this session and a few of the other sessions that we've had so far. Uh, so far. And then, um, and then I'll introduce uh, uh, Pavel uh, Podvik, uh, and he'll start with some discussion of things before his proper first start uh, begins. So, Fred, please. Thank you. I, I take this opportunity to just say a few words about what's on this handout flyer that's distributed throughout the room. Um, a couple of years ago, some physicists who are experts on nuclear weapons and arms control felt that the physics community needs to get re-engaged with this problem. And it was something that the physics APS strongly supported. And so this w was created by a group of people founding it and was supported for several years by APS financially and in other ways. Um, it, it's now moved on to be an independent group because the seed money cannot be renewed. So that was used, and but it's still based in the physics community, although reaching out to um, nuclear scientists and others, scientists um, of all kinds. So this brochure or flyers on some of the chairs and so on, but it basically summarizes the mission, if you will, and the founding of the coalition, which is based on the fact that Physicists really were involved, of course, in the original development of nuclear weapons and have always been very responsibly involved in trying to make sure that no terrible things happen because of that. And so given the situation that's developed now, which you know, we'll hear more about, uh, it was felt that it was really important for the physics community in the United States to really get more engaged. And so that's what the founding uh, of the coalition has done. And so um, there's also a sign-up sheet, but also on here it tells you how you can go online to investigate the coalition and sign up, if you will. And uh, we're delighted to have the key staff person, Chris, who's sitting back there um, with us today. And she can also talk to you about what the coalition does. But I'll just say a couple things. Um, we are in the process of reaching out to engaging and educating students, um, young faculty, postdocs, and senior people in the physics community. So we've got now, in just a couple of a few years, over a thousand members from the physics community. And we've given, what, what is it, 60 or more uh, visits to universities and other institutions to talk about the problem, to recruit people, to educate them, and to ask them to take actions. So in addition to that, there are other things. We have webinars to help inform our membership, but also other people can often uh, attend. We have action alerts to take specific actions by contacting policymakers in the Congress and so on um, to take action at timely moments when they can have an impact. So we can talk more about that later. Chris or I would be happy to do that. So thanks very much for having me this opportunity to talk about it. So I look forward to Pavel's talk. Okay, our, our first talk was on the New START Treaty and um, uh, the, the title of it was the U.S.-Russian Nuclear Arms Control Prospects Three Years Before New START's Expiration. Uh, the New START Treaty was one of the most important uh, arms control treaty we uh, have. In fact, it's uh, really the only one remaining to severely restrict the nuclear weapons. And uh, as most of you know, it's greatly imperiled now with the announcement of suspension of, uh, of some aspects of this uh, treaty. And day by day, there's um, uh, tricky elements associated with the Russian and uh, U.S. Uh, relationship on the New START Treaty. Uh, so, uh, 
Pavel Podvik, who's our second speaker, is a world's expert in that as well. Uh, and, and I'll just introduce him very briefly. Um, uh, Pavel, he's a senior researcher in WMD program at uh, UNIDIR. Uh, his uh, current research focuses on nuclear disarmament, arms control, and nuclear security. Pavel uh, started his work at the Center for Arms Control Studies at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. He is also a researcher with the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University and a member of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. He runs his own research project on Russian nuclear forces and he holds a PhD in the political science uh, from Moscow Institute of World Economy and International Relations. However, I believe our speaker may be here. Yes, oh, hello. Shannon Brogas is a senior policy analyst at the Arms Control Association, uh, where she contributes research and analysis reports for Arms Control Today and creates and updates Arms Control Association online resources. And let me just briefly say that she, uh, before our Arms Control Association, she was communications and writing manager at the Truman Center for National Policy um, and uh, received her a BA from University of Notre Dame. And if you have slides, I can set them up for you. If not, welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shannon Bugis. Thank you for the very kind introduction, and I'm very excited to be here today. I'm without slides, so you're going to have to deal with me and just my voice to keep you entertained. But when I wrote my abstract for this presentation in January, the state of the U.S.-Russia nuclear arms control relationship looked a little bit different from what it does today. So in my speech today, I intend to sketch out from a U.S. perspective the course of U.S.-Russia nuclear arms control efforts over the past several years to provide necessary context, the priorities each country has for future arms control, and the potential and the potential way to go from where we are today. So the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or New START, is the only current, only current nuclear arms control treaty left standing between the United States and Russia, the owners of the two largest nuclear weapons arsenals in the world. Unfortunately, New START has taken some serious blows over the past year in particular. While being clear-eyed about the challenges and the harsh realities, I do genuinely hold even though it's a very small amount, optimism for Washington and Moscow to recognize the importance of arms control and act upon that recognition by carrying arms control forward. First, I will briefly define arms control and the benefits it brings. Then we'll take a quick history lesson into the past few years so as to better understand where we are now before going into each country's respective priorities in a suggested way forward. So, beginning, the definitional stage. So, traditionally, arms control has referred to formal treaties imposing specific limits on or the elimination of particular components of U.S. and Russian or Soviet nuclear arsenals. These days, however, the advent of new and emerging technologies, the development and deployment of new nuclear weapon delivery systems, and the advancing abilities of existing nuclear weapon systems have made the concept of traditional arms control increasingly unlikely. Therefore, and this has been going on for a number of years, most experts tend to take on a broader perspective of what arms control means. So to take that traditional understanding and make it a bit broader, you can think of arms control as something along lines of a form of mutual agreement or commitment through which states aim to reduce nuclear risks. This definition leaves the door open for less formal, perhaps not legally binding, forms of agreement. An important related term that you'll hear me use a lot today and that you hear a lot in the context of arms control is strategic stability. So this term is most often defined as the situation in which nuclear powers are deterred from launching, launching a nuclear strike, nuclear first strike, excuse me, against one another and do not have an incentive to build up their own nuclear forces. Strategic stability can be defined by a variety of capabilities, whether nuclear or non-nuclear, offensive or defensive. So arms control then can be thought of as a tool with which to maintain and enhance strategic stability. The benefits of arms control, whether undertaken in times of relationships highs or lows in peacetime or wartime, can be many, and including just to name a few, avoiding an action-reaction arms race, 
reducing incentives to preemptively strike adversary conventional and or nuclear forces, lowering the chances of inadvertent escalation, increasing transparency and predictability, and lastly, saving money, which generally sounds good to everyone. So history, and this is gonna be real quick, and also Pavel and Tang Zhao are way better at the, U at the Russian and Chinese views of history, so I do wanna emphasize that this is the US perspective. Um, so the first nuclear arms control arrangement between the United States and the Soviet Union dates back to 1972 with the interim agreement and the anti-ballistic missile treaty. The road from 1972 to new start in 2010 involved many ups and downs, treaties that came to pass and those that did not. For today, due to time and me being late, we will be unable to begin back in the 1970s, which I know you all would be loving to hear about, but instead start with the late 2010s. And beware, again, I'm jumping forward, and this is a broad overview so you can kind of understand where we're going. So a few years prior to the initial expiration of New START in February 2021, Washington and Moscow began to discuss the potential five-year extension of the treaty as allowed by the treaty text. The two countries primarily met within the context of the Bilateral Strategic Stability Dialogue, which covers a whole host of issues, one of them being nuclear arms control. 2019 marked a significant uptick in the attention given to New START, as the recognition hit that the treaty would expire in two years or less and counting. In December 2019, Russia offered to extend New START without conditions and the following year saw a lot of back and forth between Moscow and Washington. The Trump administration attempted to condition the treaty's five-year extension on China becoming party to the accord and then having the treaty also address Russian tactical nuclear weapons. And another wonky term, this is again brief, uh, broad overview, but tactical nuclear weapons are understood as being designed for a battlefield or so-called limited nuclear use and possessing shorter ranges and lower yields than the strategic nuclear weapons, which you think of with ICBMs, right? So the thought process in forming the development and the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons has generally been to have a smaller, more precise nuclear weapon that is more prompt than a strategic nuclear weapon. For comparison's sake, the bomb that the U.S. dropped on Hiroshima was around 15 kilotons, and that would be defined as a tactical nuclear weapon today. So, and many modern tactical nuclear weapons also have yields that are bigger than that. So think about that when it's battlefield, small use, and it's kind of a misnomer in my opinion. All right, back to the timeline. So Washington and Moscow did get close to an agreement, close, somewhat close, closer than they were before in October 2020, and the proposal was, the potential agreement on the table was a one-year extension of New START with a one-year freeze on all U.S. and Russian nuclear warheads. The freeze would have applied to both strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. <clears throat> tactical nuclear weapons have never been subject to arms control before. The agreement did not ultimately go through due to the Trump administration adding on a requirement that there be a verification regime for this agreement. This would have been difficult to implement simply because tactical nuclear weapons have not been subject to arms control before. And there are very, it's an ongoing conversation about how to verify tactical nuclear weapons without giving away any sensitive information. Strategic nuclear weapons, as we see with New START, there are those types of verification procedures in place but those procedures do not necessarily can be transferred over to tactical nuclear weapons, and that's a pretty big hurdle. So ultimately, the Trump administration left the decision to on new start extension to the Biden administration, which agreed in February 2021 to extend the treaty until 2026. The treaty only allows for one five-year extension, so that was it, at least one formal five-year extension. Biden and Putin met in person in June 2021, and they had agreement then to relaunch the bilateral, long-standing strategic stability dialogue. The restarted dialogue aimed to focus on the risk of nuclear war and setting the stage for future arms control and risk reduction measures, 
but the United States and Russia only managed to meet a few times before Russia launched, launched its invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. As a result of this invasion, the Biden administration paused the strategic stability dialogue. Moscow and Washington did, however, continue to communicate about restarting New START on-site inspections, which had been paused by mutual agreement in March 2020 due to COVID. These on-site inspections are a very, very important part of New START's verification regime. Essentially, the two sides exchange very detailed data on their respective strategic nuclear arsenals twice a year. The on-site inspections are used to help verify that information with boots on the ground at nuclear weapons related facilities subject to the treaty. So it is US inspectors going to Russia and vice versa. The US Defense Department has actually gone on the record multiple times, emphasizing the great value it places on the New START verification regime, and that if that information, if that, those data exchanges stopped happening, the Pentagon would have to find an alternative way to get that information. Because think about it, right? They're getting it handed to them versus having to find other avenues. And it is pretty detailed information, both classified and unclassified portions. So Moscow and Washington have been in discussions since June 2021 about restarting these inspections. But in August, this, dis this discussion was cut off when Russia informed the United States that it was prohibiting inspections of its nuclear weapons related facilities subject to the treaty from any inspections. So Russia had cited as the justification for that ongoing unresolved issues about how to actually the process to resume those inspections, including inspection procedures if someone um, US or Russian inspection teams got COVID, as well as difficulties for Russian flight crews and inspectors, the difficulties they encountered when trying to get visas and coming to the United States for these inspections. The Russian decision came just shortly after the United States had notified Russia that it was planning to conduct an inspection. The treaty has an implementation body called the Bilateral Consultative Commission, also called the BCC, to deal with issues that pop up about carrying out the implement implementation procedures of New START. And so by implementation body, it is just a, um, a meeting. There's, they're supposed to meet twice a year for about two weeks and just hash out some of these issues like inspections, right? It's tied directly to the treaty and they have this format specifically for that purpose so that those issues don't end up kind of expanding and undermining the treaty. So there was a BCC session scheduled for this past November in Egypt. And then shortly beforehand, Russian officials had said that they would not be showing up under orders from the highest political levels um, which we read to mean from direct orders from the Kremlin. So then, I swear we're coming to near the end of the history section. February 2023, a few things happened in rapid succession. So February 8th, the United States released an annual assessment of compliance by the United States and Russia with the treaty. So the United States had assessed that Russia was no longer in full compliance with New START due to the refusal to restart on-site inspections, as well as refusal to reschedule that BCC meeting from November within 40 di 45 days of when it was supposed to be held. And that is, or the 45 days of the notification of the meeting. So they have like that set time frame to encourage you to still have the meeting. Less than two weeks later, on February 21st, was when Putin declared Russia's official suspension of the treaty there's not a particular clause in the treaty text that allows for a suspension. So at this stage, the US, to give you an idea, the US-Russian relationship was at such a low that according to reports, when Putin went on stage on February 21st, in part to make this announcement on the treaty, the Biden administration was expecting him to say that Russia was completely withdrawing from New START. All right, so hopefully you stayed with me through that quicker than quick history rundown. So I want to turn to the primary grievances cited by both the United States and Russia concerning this current dispute over New START. Russia's stated concerns include its years long charge that the United States did not modify or convert 56 Trident submarine launched ballistic missile launchers and 41 B-52 
B-52H stratofortress bombers from nuclear to conventional roles in order to fall within the treaty limits and having those conversions be made, oh, five minutes already, having those conversions be made in a way that Russia could confirm. So Moscow also argued that the sanctions and restrictions imposed by the United States and its allies and partners over Ukraine obstructed Russia, Russian inspectors from securing the necessary visas and travel arrangements to visit US nuclear weapons related facilities subject to the treaty. So since I only have five minutes, I'm probably gonna skip through some of this. So we have concerns from the Russian side. We also have concerns from the US side. So the United States, for instance, one of the main things that Washington requests is to bring, to engage in arms control with China or engage in risk reduction. Um, that under the Trump administration was one of the main things. The Biden administration, I think, has made a better move in trying to open a bilateral dialogue with China or engage China in the P5 process, which includes Britain, France, China, Russia, the United States, and the UK. So with my final minutes, I do want to go to just jump directly to the arms control priorities um, and the, way, the potential way forward for US and Russian arms control. Because if you can't tell by the place that I work, this is something that I have to keep thinking about and bringing the, the dose of optimism that I have. So for, okay, yeah. So for the Biden administration, they aim, some of their aims, right, are China, um, engaging in risk reduction with China, even though that's now on a separate track rather than engaged with uh, trilaterally with the United States and Russia. Then we have the tactical nuclear weapons and then new Russian nuclear weapon delivery systems, such as those that I'm sure you've heard about in the news with names such as Poseidon. And so then on the other side for Russia, Russia's nuclear arms control priorities is when the US says we want to engage with China, Russia says, how about also France and the UK? So this is a good opportunity to again work within the P5 process to talk about some risk reduction and arms control measures in there. In addition, when the US wants to talk about Russian tactical nukes, Russia says they want to talk about US ones, which is fair. So the United States has about 100 tactical nuclear weapons deployed across six bases in five NATO countries in Europe. Then there's also the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. And so there are some missiles that had fallen under that treaty, which covered all ground-launched nuclear conventional ballistic and cruise missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. In the past, both the United States and Russia have signaled a willingness to talk on this subject, so hopefully there may be some way forward there. All right, so the million-dollar question of what are the next steps for both current and future arms control. I want to emphasize here that if New START does expire in 2026 with no replacement, U.S. and Russian nuclear weapon arsenals will be left with no limits whatsoever. Both Moscow and Washington could then decide to potentially up to double the size of their nuclear arsenals, according to estimates from the Federation of American Scientists. For new START-related issues, that's where the BCC comes into play, and so the first step there would be to get a new meeting of the BCC on the calendar. Sounds easy. It's very difficult right now. And then for future arms control, meaning like post-2026. The prospect for that arrangement has been difficult for a while, and it's even more so now. So the most promising route is for the United States and Russia to strike a political agreement to continue to adhere to the central limits of New START until they agree to a new arms control arrangement. The political ag agreement would only address the central limits, so the verification regime would fall away. And so when we're then talking about future arms control, that is when I would emphasize first order of business would be talking about potential central limits. So under New START, the US and Russia are limited to 1550 strategic nuclear warheads deployed on 700 delivery vehicles. There have been proposals to bring that number down lower. That would be a very difficult push right now, especially with the Pentagon's concern over China's nuclear arsenal. But there's a lot of good conversation happening within the expert community about what that future arrangement might look like with those central limits. And then once we address that, that's where we can bring in other issues such as INF range missiles. From there, it does get a little bit thornier with the tactical nuclear weapons, with US missile defenses. 
I don't think there's any way that there will be a next agreement unless the U.S. talks about its missile defense programs. And then also um, bringing in other, other nuclear-armed countries. So I think I'm probably running out of time right now. So I'm going to skip to my concluding thoughts and happy to talk more after this. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, the questions of if New START will return to full implementation and if the United States and Russia can figure out arms control, those have become political questions. In the past, the United States and Russia have been able to engage on arms control no matter what else is happening throughout the world. That's a very broad statement, but they have, on the whole, been able to do that. So there's the hope that they will continue to do that today. So it's also critical for me to reiterate here that Putin's war of choice in Ukraine is indefensible, and Russia has been hit with real consequences from countries across the world. At the same time, arms control still has value, if only to ensure that the Russian nuclear arsenal remains constrained and open to a measure of transparency, and that applies to the United States as well. And so, yeah, certainly not the first time throughout history that they've had a, had a relationship at a low, but there is hope that some type of dialogue on arms control and risk reduction, which I realize I said risk reduction a fair amount without explaining it, but it's, think of it, right, as a little bit less formal of, an, of agreements than arms control. And so those still are hopefully on the table, even if they'll look very different than ideas that have been out there in previous years. And so the Biden administration has reiterated that it remains open to talk about arms control no matter what else is going on in the world. And so that's an important statement. That's one that I would endorse and remains to be seen if Russia will take the United States up on that and if both countries will be able to cooperate on a new arms control arrangement. So thank you very much for your questions. Thanks for bearing with me as I skipped around. And I look forward to Q&A later. Oh, Q&A right now. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, go to the mic. We have a few minutes for that. Uh, this is being recorded, so we, we need to go to the mic uh, for people from the outside. If anybody would like to ask a question. Hello, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there's something like a cutoff where you say, I mean, if you look at Russia and the United States, the number of nuclear weapons they have is so enormous. Is there some number where you say it doesn't matter anymore if you have twice the number or three times the number? I mean, it doesn't make any change in if you have a nuclear attack on the other side. So yeah, why, why does this not come into effect? Thank you for your question, and you're hitting on an issue that is lighting up Washington right now. Um, so you're very right, like, if we're taking the new start number of limiting uh, both sides to 1550 strategic nuclear warheads deployed on 700 delivery vehicles, the problem that we're encountering when talking with the Pentagon about bringing that number potentially down is that over the past few years, China has expanded and diversified its nuclear arsenal. And so I think it was 2021 when some experts at the Federation of American Scientists and at Middlebury in California had found the construction of new ICBM solos across, I think, three total sites in China, not to say that every silo is filled. Um, that is still what a lot of people are trying to analyze. Um, but the reason that your question is somewhat bringing controversy is because the Pentagon says they need more nuclear weapons to counter both China and Russia, because the 1550 number was agreed to in 2010. And arguably, and it's true, the world has changed since then. And so having that conversation about what's the new number, having a number is also difficult in and of itself because there are new nuclear weapons capabilities, so you can't really do a one-for-one, like-for-like -for -like situation. Um, you have to take into account other factors. But there is a proposal out there by a, a number of different experts that Perhaps there can be a number agreed to that covers all nuclear weapons, um, both strategic and tactical, and maybe work within like a ratio of warheads to delivery vehicles. So the conversation is happening. I think it's a very interesting one, but it's very tough to counter the Pentagon right now. Okay. Yeah, very quick we, one. Um, yes, we have one more question. I'm, I'm sorry in the back, uh, unfortunately, but afterwards, perhaps. Thanks. Oh, so may I? Yes, okay. please. 
Um, so working in this field professionally, I just want to know, how do you take care of yourself mentally? That's a, that's a good question. So I don't know if what I'll say will be controversial or not, but considering my job is to think about nuclear war every day, that is a pretty sad contemplation. I personally do my best for good or ill to just, when I shut my computer at the end of the day, that is the end of my day. I will, I'm a big reader, so I tend not to read nuclear-related books in my free time, um, which, again, I could always be better read, but I gotta draw the line somewhere, and sometimes I just really need to read some lighthearted fiction. But I think, ultimately, at the end of the day, what helps is that there's a lot of people in this field, and so we're all in the same boat. And so, DC, I'm lucky to live there. I'm lucky to be in the midst of a nuclear community where we're allowed to go, like the clock strikes five, and we go have a drink and try and de-stress. Um, not always the easiest, especially the past couple of years, and I can no longer ride the high of New Start being extended on my birthday in 2021, but it was a very good birthday gift. But yeah, you gotta take the hope where you can. That's why I try and keep my tiny bit of optimism alive. Thank you. Thank you all, and feel free to catch me later for questions, too. Thank you. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Pavel Podvik uh, speak to us next. Thanks. My, my first, my real education is in physics, so, but I'm not a physicist, not a real one anyway, uh, which is, I feel very acutely here at the meeting like that, but I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to speak. Um, and uh, I appreciate the support uh, of the uh, University of Illinois uh, Physics Department that brought me here. Yes, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, go to the, <clears throat> so the support of the uh, University of Illinois Physics Department was very important. So uh, let me uh, just uh, I'll start with saying that, uh, of course, uh, everybody noticed that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, created a situation where uh, nuclear weapons became very uh, visible uh, in the uh, <clears throat> uh, in the international stage, and uh, usually it is framed as Russia's nuclear threats, and there were threats. Uh, the uh, the very first statement at the, uh, at the day of the invasion, uh, uh, there was uh, this uh, phrase that uh, you will see the consequences that you've never seen in your entire history, which was a direct reference to nuclear weapons, and that was directed to those who may. Uh, uh, think about interfering. Uh, then a, a couple of days later, uh, there was an order to put Russian de deterrence forces in high combat alert. Uh, then uh, uh, there was an episode in September uh, around that kind of a dirty bomb uh, uh, business. Uh, and uh, at that time, Russia already annexed the, uh, uh, the territory, uh, the new territories, uh, and uh, there was a message, again, coming uh, from uh, President Putin that uh, the threats to uh, territorial integrity uh, will, we will <coughs> certainly make use of all weapon systems available to us. So again, that's, uh, that was taken as direct reference to nuclear weapons. Uh, and of course, uh, this, uh, this situation brought uh, all, all questions about the kind of nuclear deterrence, how it works, does it work, uh, what kind of lessons can we learn from here? And uh, uh, in a way, we are living through this very macabre experiment, uh, and uh, it is important to draw uh, the, uh, the correct lessons out of this, uh, and uh, uh, right lessons. Uh, and I would argue, as you may have guessed from the title of my talk, that the, uh, the lesson that we should learn uh, from this is that uh, nuclear weapons are obsolete. Uh, not that they are dangerous, we know that, and they are, uh, but they are obsolete as an instrument of political or military power. Uh, and uh, before uh, we uh, go there, uh, again, uh, they, the, the, the grim reality is that the weapons are there. Uh, if we're talking about Russia, the Russia has uh, about uh, 450 uh, missiles, the ICBMs, the intercontinental missiles, uh, land-based and uh, submarine-based missiles with 1,500 warheads. 
uh, and those are in reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, readiness uh, to be used. Uh, Russia does uh, have this kind of a retaliatory posture. The idea is that the, it would retaliate if, uh, if it is attacked. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are, even though uh, there are, they are in high readiness uh, of being used, but still there are steps uh, that would still uh, be taken uh, if uh, that degree of readiness uh, is uh, raised uh, further. Uh, there are a number of, you could disperse your mobile ICBMs, you could uh, send submarines to the sea, and uh, uh, you could prepare uh, the command and control system. Uh, important also, and that, that will be important uh, in, in, a, in a moment, sort of, uh, <coughs> also important that uh, other weapons that are not on ICBMs and SLBMs, they are uh, what I uh, would call, they are, they're not deployed. So the bomber weapons uh, and uh, uh, so-called non-strategic weapons, uh, they are normally uh, in, uh, in storage. Uh, they, are, uh, they are guarded. Uh, storage may be located reasonably close to the uh, uh, sites where the delivery systems are deployed, but they may be uh, farther away. Uh, and uh, uh, but the, in any event, uh, the idea is that uh, bringing those weapons to the point where they could be used uh, would require a number of steps, uh, and uh, that you would need to uh, go uh, to that bunker, take those weapons, load them on trucks, drive them to the airfield, uh, attach them to uh, aircraft or mate uh, warheads with missiles. So it is a procedure. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a procedure that would be visible, and uh, we, uh, uh, we haven't seen uh, any of that. And again, uh, it is important that in both cases, so uh, in uh, ICBMs, SLBMs, and, and, and bombers and other weapons, uh, it is uh, important that uh, even though uh, they uh, might be in a uh, high degree of readiness. Still, it's not uh, like, uh, the situation is not like uh, the president has a button on, on his desk uh, that he could push and it just everything goes off. No, there are steps, uh, there are procedures uh, that uh, the uh, commander in chief in Russia, the president, uh, would have to, to go through uh, to actually use those weapons. Uh, and in, in the case when, uh, Russia is under attack. Uh, this procedure is uh, kind of a compressed in a way, uh, but if it's uh, the first use is still possible, but uh, it is uh, it is uh, it is a process that involves uh, a number of people. We, I wouldn't speculate uh, how many exactly, but it will involve a number of people. And that brings me to the uh, other point uh, that if you look at this uh, and you ask yourself, uh, okay, what if uh, Russia would decide to use uh, nuclear weapons. To what purpose? What are the options? Uh, if we're looking, so uh, these uh, we, tactical, non-strategic weapons, they are kind of, they were de developed for battlefield use, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but if you look at the uh, actual war, the actual military action on the ground, uh, you will see that uh, nuclear weapons would, would, would not have made a lot, many or at all uh, difference on uh, in this particular war. Uh, if you go, uh, nuclear weapons are not actually not very effective military uh, weapons. Uh, it's literally, uh, unless you are prepared to uh, drop a, a nuclear bomb on each uh, uh, tank column of, uh, on each tank basically, uh, they are not doing you any good. Uh, so there, there is no uh, kind of a good, uh, uh, good use of those weapons in military sense. So that, I think the, the consensus uh, now is that this is not really something uh, you could do. Uh, you could think about the tax uh, on the infrastructure, the military infra infrastructure, for example, but then again, this is a, a, a the, uh, the, the nature of war, of this war in particular, uh, in, and probably similar wars, is that there are not that many uh, critical uh, targets uh, of the kind that could be uh, literally make or break in the, in the course of military action. 
uh, if you, you could think about civilian infrastructure, and again, you could, you could see that Russia actually has tried to uh, attack civilian infrastructure, and probably the military inf infrastructure as well with conventional weapons. Uh, and uh, it, it is easy uh, uh, to see that even if those attacks would have been more uh, efficient in destroying the targets, uh, it is not clear that uh, any uh, kind of single use of weapon uh, would have been uh, really decisive. Uh, again, uh, it would have required a massive use of, uh, of, uh, of nuclear weapons, uh, which uh, again, is uh, uh, very problematic. Uh, so, in the end, uh, the the only kind of a way uh, to use nuclear weapons uh, would be to use them in a strategic sense, uh, as as I usually say, the Hiroshima Nagasaki style, sort of to shock uh, your opponent into submission, and uh, uh, and that is. Uh, Probably it might be possible, even though uh, I think if you uh, look uh, at the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, you could argue that actually uh, the shock at the time uh, was not the primary or definitely not the only reason why Japan surrendered. There is a debate <coughs> about that. And you could ex uh, ex expect, in fact, uh, that you, and I've, I've, I've had conversation with uh, many Ukrainians, uh, they very often they say, no, they, if, if that uh, uh, would be uh, an attack on the city, that wouldn't have, be, uh, wouldn't have been uh, a reason for Ukraine to surrender. It's quite the contrary. Uh, but in any event, uh, for that shock to be uh, uh, effective, really truly shocking, uh, it, would it would have to involve uh, literally uh, uh, killing a lot of people tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of people in just one, in, in cold blood, basically. Uh, the same would, uh, would be, uh, uh, would be uh, the case with the so-called demonstration strike. You could, you could imagine that uh, a nuclear weapon could be exploded over I don't know, the Black Sea at some al altitude and they won't harm anyone uh, or uh, uh, things like that. But that, the message there, the only reason you would use a weapon like that would be to demonstrate that you are prepared to go ahead and kill uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of people. So that's the message there. And even if you uh, go and look at the battlefield use, again, you could imagine the, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a nuclear weapon dropped on the uh, on the column of tanks, uh, but then again, the, the only message there would be that, yes, you. Uh, the side that is, uh, has used that, these weapons uh, is prepared to uh, go all the way. So that's, the, that's something that uh, we, we need to clearly understand, that this is the only role of nuclear weapons. And in fact, that's, uh, that understanding actually uh, did, uh, did uh, uh, it was understood that way by the international community, uh, uh, large in, uh, international community. Uh, it, uh, you, you, can, you see a few, a few quotes, uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, said we condemn uh, all, any and all nuclear threats. Uh, then there was uh, uh, countries like India, China, uh, said very clearly that uh, the Indian Defense Minister said that it's against the basic tenets of humanity. Uh, there was a uh, China-Germany Ger statement, a uh, summit statement. There was a Biden-Xi statement uh, that says that uh, opposition to the use and further use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, finally, there was a, a, a G20 summit declaration in Bal uh, Bali uh, that clearly said that nuclear threats are inadmissible. That was uh, kind of when the, the United States and Russia actually signed up. So you could see that there was a very strong backlash against that kind of rhetoric. Against uh, when people started kind of processing the idea of a possibility of uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons being used, I, I think that, that, that notion that the only way you could use them is literally to kill a lot of people, uh, that was a very strong uh, signal. And it, in, a, in the end, Russia had to go into defensive and Russia had to uh, the kind of say, no, 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 we are, we, we are sticking to our uh, doctrine. Uh, the doctrine says it's only the case of an aggression against Russia with, uh, that would put in danger the very existence of the state. Uh, the foreign ministry issued a statement uh, emphasizing that 
uh, there is no expansive interpretation. And, and you, could, you, could, you, could, you could argue again that uh, when people, a lot of people worried about this kind of uh, new territories and protecting the territories and all that, uh, that, oh, this is where if someone tries to recapture Crimea, Russia will uh, strike, uh, uh, use nuclear weapons somehow. Uh, but uh, one question is sort of how Russia would use nuclear weapons to stop recapture of uh, Crimea. That's, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, again, the, the, the foreign ministry, sort of the, the message there was that no, uh, this is not, uh, this is an expansive interpretation of the doctrine and that, that, uh, that is not how it should be interpreted. It's, uh, you could argue, and it is true that uh, the, the, none of these things would be argued in court, right? So there, there won't be like a court that would decide, oh, this is you stuck, this is in compliance with your doctrine and this is not. Uh, but I would argue that this is, uh, this is nevertheless very important because uh, the fact that nobody recognized, uh, well, almost nobody recognized the annexation of uh, Crimea, nobody uh, I, I don't think that anybody uh, ever recognized these new territories. Uh, so uh, there was a pressure, there was an understanding from the, uh, from the there was a message from the international community uh, that uh, uh, no, this is not your territory and you could not possibly uh, argue that you, you would protect the territorial integrity and resort to nuclear weapons. And some, uh, I, I, and, and that was strong, I, I remember the president of Kazakhstan said uh, it, uh, on, on the stage directly to Putin in person, he said, no, we are not going to recognize your new, new territories, that's just out of the question. So I think that that's, uh, that pressure actually uh, does exist and it, I, I do believe that it does work. Uh, so now you, you ask sort of, well, but what did Russia get out of nu nuclear weapons? And on some level, people say, yes, but uh, it is true that, and you could argue that, uh, yes, nuclear weapons uh, uh, allowed Russia to launch this aggression, allowed Russia to launch this war. Uh, but my answer to that is that uh, Russia was in so much better position from any point of view, literally any point of view, before it launched that war and before the annexation of Crimea. Uh, politically, economically, uh, soft power wise, uh, uh, the, uh, it was a member before Crimea, it was a member of G8 and so it was, and now you, could, you, you look at the country that is, uh, that is uh, actually in a very difficult situation from any point of view. So in that sense, uh, the, uh, that should be 22. 2012 too. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is clear that all the nuclear weapons uh, have done for Russia is actually to to allow this uh, uh, destructive uh, behavior. So Russia would have been much better off without them. Uh, of course, uh, many people uh, argue, and I'm sure you've heard that. Uh, oh, Ukraine shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have. Uh, given up its nuclear weapons that it inherited from the Soviet Union. It's a complicated issue, as I usually say, it's like too many counterfactuals, but even if you imagine that by some magic, Ukraine had nuclear weapons uh, today or a year ago, what would it do? Because again, it, again, it boils down to this issue that to, uh, they are useless at the, on a battlefield uh, and uh, you, the only option is actually to go ahead and kill a lot of people. Uh, and I'm not sure that actually uh, the uh, president of Ukraine would have made that choice. Uh, and then uh, always also, you, if you go back to 2014 to the annexation of Crimea, I think there is a good, uh, there, there, I, I believe that there is a good argument that uh, given how that operation actually uh, took place, uh, that was, uh, I'm, I'm, fairly certain that uh, even if Ukraine had nuclear weapons at the time, it wouldn't have used them, so that wouldn't be uh, prevented, uh, the, uh, the separation. So uh, what about NATO? Uh, so does nuclear NATO, this deterrence, uh, deter? Uh, and uh, again, the argument that you, you hear uh, all the time is that, oh, but NATO, you see nuclear deterrence work because Russia hasn't attacked NATO and uh, this is why we, uh, uh, 
why nuclear weapons are good, because uh, they protect uh, NATO. But do they? My take is that uh, the, the, the trick about uh, this extended deterrence in NATO is that uh, the, uh, the, the deterrence is extended only to those states that don't really need it. Uh, like, uh, so for example, uh, yes, uh, Poland may uh, make all the kind of arguments that they are threat, there is a threat of invasion or from Russia or something, uh, but I always ask people, uh, the, the last time Poland was in a real danger of being invaded uh, was in 1981, and that was the Soviet Union. There was no extended deterrence. Uh, the Soviet Union had troops on the Pol Polish territory, and still the Soviet Union didn't dare. So why would anybody think that Russia would sort of uh, 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 try to uh, invade Poland uh, today? So the same thing, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, Finland or Sweden uh, would feel safer in some way uh, uh, behind the uh, NATO fence, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that they were in much of danger uh, uh, before. Uh, and as you can see with, the, with, the, with, with Ukraine, uh, because there was a danger of, because Ukraine was in danger, Georg Georgia was in danger, Moldova maybe uh, in real danger, then the NATO is very reluctant to extend its deterrence uh, to, to them. Uh, in, uh, in a different corner of the world, you could see this discussion uh, about Taiwan uh, in the United States, where a lot of people uh, kind of uh, don't want to uh, extend protection to Taiwan precisely because Taiwan is in real danger. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's, uh, that tells me that deterrence deters threats that don't exist. So that's, that's, that would be my take. Uh, and, if you look at uh, sort of the other argument that people make is that, uh, but look, uh, the, the threat of the catastrophic consequences that the United States promised uh, uh, would follow uh, uh, if Russia uses uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine, uh, that prevented Russia's uh, nuclear use. I would say that that, that has not because, uh, in fact, if you look at this, uh, there are, uh, there, there's never been a good option to, to, to respond uh, to a nuclear use. Uh, uh, because the threat, of, uh, the threat of a nuclear response from NATO to, uh, to, uh, against Russia uh, is actually, in my view, is absolutely not credible uh, because uh, then uh, the, kind of the, the key from the escalation ladder uh, are in Russia's hand. And in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the the uh, the situation that NATO finds itself in uh, these days uh, is that uh, again it it has no control over uh, over what the this escalation ladder because uh, my kind of a nightmare scenario if you will uh, is that Russia will just attack uh, the territory of Poland conventionally maybe and then the uh, you you can see that there are absolutely no good choices there. Uh, from the NATO uh, point of view, because uh, that's, uh, uh, that could escalate uh, all the way up. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in my view, again, uh, the, uh, well, we, we can talk, uh, in my view, the, the best strategy for NATO would be, uh, the United States and NATO would be to uh, rule out uh, nuclear use uh, entirely, but that's uh, another, uh, uh, another uh, point. So, on a larger uh, kind of, again, back to this idea of uh, nuclear weapon, uh, weapons being obsolete, uh, I think it's, uh, they, are, they, are, uh, they are worse than that. They are actively harmful. Uh, and if you look at the, again, at the European security environment that exists uh, today, to the extent you can call it a security environment, uh, you can see that actually uh, the existence of nuclear weapons uh, has some responsibility for where we are today. Uh, because uh, the, uh, whatever effort was there to build uh, the new European security architecture, it clearly failed. Uh, uh, and uh, as a result, nobody, uh, nobody, is, uh, uh, nobody uh, is actually secure. And it's not, uh, again, uh, you, you could think about it as an opportunity cost uh, in that 
sort of the decision was made uh, to rely mm. uh, on uh, this kind of a NATO expansion as a primary mechanism of, uh, uh, of providing security in the, in the continent. Uh, and uh, the idea was that, oh, uh, once, once everybody is under this nuclear umbrella, everything uh, would be fine, and we needn't worry about uh, what happens in, in Russia or other places. And we can see that that's, uh, that's, that, that's a total failure of, of that approach. And not in the sense uh, that, uh, as many people say, that, oh, it's NATO expansion fault, not in the sense that uh, the NATO exp expansion did not take into account uh, the legitimate security interests of Russia. No, that's not, the, uh, uh, that's not uh, what I mean. Uh, my point is that uh, the only uh, real security environment would have been where nobody would care if you are in NATO or not. Nobody would, Ukraine wouldn't care if it's a member of NATO. And Russia wouldn't care if Ukraine is in NATO. Uh, and, uh, and NATO wouldn't care if Ukraine is there. So, and, and some of that what was possible. It wouldn't be uh, easy, of course, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, one thing that uh, uh, we should understand that the, this idea of extended deterrence and this idea that, oh, we just will build this kind of a nuclear fence uh, around this secure uh, area and we are, will be fine, uh, that idea failed uh, very, uh, very dramatically. And I think that that's, uh, in a way, uh, Ukrainians are paying the price for this kind of a fantasy of this uh, nuclear umbrella. And that's, uh, uh, again, R Russia, of course, uh, is at fault here, but uh, it's it just, we need to understand that that's the, that was the failure of um, the process. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that. Okay, final uh, word, final uh, slide. So again, the bottom line is that, as I said, uh, if you look at it, uh, nuclear weapons are not a military, uh, uh, not a military instrument by a long shot. It's a very poor political instrument, uh, and uh, uh, what's another lesson that we could learn from this is uh, the, the numbers of weapons are not really that important. Uh, because uh, why? I mean, why does it matter if Russia has a uh, thousand nuclear uh, tactical non-strategic weapons or hundred? It's again, we are talking about uh, small numbers here. And uh, in my view, uh, the most important lesson uh, is that this uh, delegitimization works. So uh, there is a strong backlash against the idea of, uh, of nuclear weapons, and I think that this is. Uh, uh, this is the lesson we should uh, take uh, from this, and uh, I do hope that we will move in that direction. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that nice provocative talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, I, 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 while people are lining up, let me just say that at the end we'll have some questions uh, uh, some time for questions of all three panelists. Uh, so uh, if, if I have to cut you off because of time, I'm very sorry about that, but we'll have some time at the end. Uh, so Laura, please, please. Um, thanks, Pavel. I appreciate you're always um, having a, a counter uh, <laughs> current to the way most people think. So it's really always thought provoking. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, one is you lay out a pretty persuasive argument that nuclear weapons aren't useful. But it seems like the easiest, perhaps laziest, lesson from this is get nuclear weapons so you don't get invaded by a nuclear armed country. Um, so do you imagine this sort of more thoughtful approach is persuasive to countries um, that may be looking at the lessons of um, Libya, for example, or, or other countries that, or, you know, and you, you laid out this, the, the comp complex issues around Ukraine it wasn't as if they just had them and got rid of them. There, there was a lot of uh, sort of internal domestic conversation about that. So just a short answer to that. And the other question, I, I also looked with a lot of interest at the G20 statement, which if you read it on its face, nuclear threats are delegitimate or, un, or are inadmissible, right? 
I mean, that's what nuclear deterrence is, is nuclear threats. So while people might want to read it as don't do this in the context of a war, really it's taking aim at deterrence, which I thought was very interesting. Um, a really very interesting statement, especially from the US and Russia, um, that runs counter, I, I don't see any softening in the United States around nuclear deterrence, um, but maybe there is, or how do you interpret that a little more deeply? Well, yeah, I, again, my, my take is that uh, we are, it, 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 is, it is a process when, again, people kind of, uh, they, they, uh, they look at the real situations and they realize that like, nuclear weapons are, yeah, the, uh, the threats are inadmissible because they, they, they are. And, uh, and they, uh, they are, uh, even even the United States, uh, I think, uh, eventually kind of gravitated toward this. Uh, they never said the United States never said that we will not use nuclear weapons, uh, but I think it is uh, uh, implied, and they, there was all kind of a leak. So they created the environment in which everybody believes that the United States committed not to use nuclear weapons against uh, 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 against Russia. If uh, uh, so, I, I think it's uh, it's for example. Uh, it's the same process as uh, as you, you would think about like chemical weapons. So it is impossible to imagine that uh, someone would respond to a threat uh, of use of chemical weapons by saying that, uh, yeah, we will also use chemical weapons in the past. As, or if someone tells you that, oh, I'm prepared to kill tens and hundreds of thousands of people, your response cannot be that, oh, I, I can also prepare to kill uh, yeah, tens and hundreds of thousands of people, which is what deterrence is. Even if you talk about this kind of a strategic stability and all this kind of a counter force and all that, it boils down to the very simple fact that uh, you are even people saying, oh, we are attacking only uh, military targets as the United States does. But in the end, it is the, the purpose of all this stability and all that is that you want to be, you want to be in a position where you have a potential to kill more people on the other side. That's it. There is nothing there, uh, nothing else. And I think that that's we uh, if we kind of internalize this and we start thinking about this in these terms, then we may get somewhere where kind of there will be this backlash will be more uh, kind of stronger. Thank you very much for drawing our attention to this important question. <laughs> Russia indeed doesn't dare to attack Ukraine with nuclear weapons right now, but it dares to attack Chernobyl and Zaporizhia nuclear power plants with heavy artillery. So do you think this should be considered a nuclear threat to Ukraine and Europe in general? Well, uh, these are different. Even though, and then, and then again, I think uh, again, you, you can also see that there there was a there was a backlash against the uh, kind of a, uh, getting involving nuclear uh, power plants into into the war, uh, and there were no uh, there were no direct attacks against uh, nuclear power plants, which Ukraine has a number of. So uh, yeah, that's. Uh, Again, I, I, I'm on the, uh, uh, on the side of uh, where, where these things are, uh, these things matter. Sort of the, back to this, when I, when I, I forgot to mention, when I talked about the, uh, uh, the procedures and that involves uh, people, uh, I think it's one thing that you, you, you are president of, of Russia uh, and you uh, kind of a, you are under attack, sort of you see the uh, missiles coming your way and then you need to react. And another thing is to call up your generals and tell them, okay, we need to use weapons, we need to kill uh, tens of hundreds, yeah, a million of people, we need to drop a bomb on, on, uh, on Kiev. That's a different decision. That's a different, you, I don't think that, that you, any president would, would be in a position to actually do this. Even if you you may remember, there was uh, in the U.S. In the, during, the, during the Trump administration days, there was this kind of there were hearings, 
And people were, the generals, I mean, everybody understood that nobody, nobody actually knows, nobody can tell precisely what the procedure is, but the generals, the US generals were saying that, well, but if the order is illegitimate, we will probably not follow it. So it is, uh, you are getting into the territory where you, and, and I, I do believe that this is in, in our power, uh, collective, like the politicians, media, public, to create the environment in which this kind of order is just unimaginable. So the, you, you cannot possibly think of that. And you cannot, even if you are someone in, uh, in, uh, as a Russian president who has kind of a, a strange idea of the reality, uh, but still you cannot really rely on your subordinates to have that vision. So that's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, I'd be happy to, yeah, yeah. to answer more questions. So we have time we for to, uh, yeah, two, two very short questions or one longer question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not short, but I think it's important, okay? So the human brain works on several levels. What you're saying here is very logical, okay? And I'm glad it has some optimism in it, but that by itself is problematic. Have you run this exercise, for example, for Hitler? Nazi Germany. What about if the mullahs of Iran decide at some point that they're so cornered that they're attacking Israel? And what will Israel do at that point? Who is going to be governing Israel, for example? Religion comes in here, right? And that's another level of, of you know, you know yeah, what I'm, what I, I'm getting I, at. Yeah, 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 I understand that. I think it's, uh, yes, but still, uh, yeah. Still, as as the we are, are there. There are no guarantees. Yeah, no, no, I, no. I understand, but still, again, my point is that uh, we are still in the uh, a, we are in the society, and there are constraints, and uh, things have changed from the uh, Hitler times, uh, and uh, it's again that's not what, what my my point is that uh, this is not. Uh, I, I'm thinking about it as there, there's a certain threshold that, that a person uh, would have to cross to issue an order like that. Uh, and what we can do, we can try to make that threshold higher. We can never be certain that uh, it is high enough, but it, we, could not, uh, we, we should not be saying that, oh, we, there is nothing we can do. No, we can do, we can do a lot. That's, okay. Go ahead, Fred. Thanks, Pavel. So I just ask a question, and maybe it can be answered later as well. But um, I found your argument, it's very persuasive. Um, but I also know that, for example, in the US, in the Defense Department, one of the strong arguments made against not reducing the number of strategic weapons in a treaty is because we're all lawyered up. And the lawyers say, you cannot attack civilians intentionally because that's against the laws of war and they use that as an argument for not going for any kind of minimal deterrence and that's been it may not seem so relevant just this moment but I think in dealing with China in dealing with Russia in the longer term it's really important to understand how to get around that argument because that has been compelling and it's prevented any discussion of significant reductions in U.S. strategic forces. Yeah, yeah. Well, but uh, again, my my take is that uh, we, we it, it deserves a separate uh, presentation for which we don't have time. But uh, the the short one is that uh, again, uh, a lot of this kind of a, the number, the bean counting, and the numbers, and the, and the, that's uh, we need we don't attack cities and all that. I, I think it's uh, uh, largely the just. Uh, it's the equilibristic. So there, there is, uh, because in the in the fundamentally, if you uh, if you look at it carefully, it is about uh, getting yourself in a position where you have the potential to kill more civilians than your opponent. This is what this whole business of survivability, the balance, uh, and all that uh, that, and uh, to that uh, there is a we. We could we could also think about how the uh, Soviet Union thought about this and uh, the and uh, there are ways there. So that's the. So. 
Okay, again, so sorry for taking too much, too much time. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, yes. Okay, our final speaker is um, uh, Tong Zhao. It's a, he is a visiting research scholar at SGS. Uh, he is also a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He was a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He's on the board of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. Tong Zhao holds a PhD in Science, Technology, and International Affairs from Georgia Institute of uh, Technology. All right. Um, so we would welcome you. And um, uh, yeah, please, please come up. So try to talk about um, how China understands the future of nuclear nonproliferation uh, regime. And um, I may need to start with the elephant in the room because if we look at the global nuclear regime, uh, China is now um, really the only one that is building up its nuclear forces so uh, rapidly and substantially. Um, and given China's growing international influence, um, uh, China's own nuclear expansion is uh, having uh, very uh, broad implications for uh, other nuclear weapon states, uh, nuclear policy, and international security in general. Uh, so maybe I want to start by talking about how China thinks, uh, why it is um, expanding its own nuclear capabilities. Um, and it is increasingly clear that um, since a few years ago, China starts a very massive nuclear expansion program. For decades, uh, China had maintained a relatively small nuclear arsenal of about 200 nuclear weapons. Uh, but this number started to uh, increase and increasingly um, rapidly uh, to increase uh, uh, a, a few years ago. Um, and uh, in 2023, this year, the uh, open source assessment is China may already uh, has uh, more than 400 uh, nuclear weapons. In other words, its arsenal has already doubled in a few years. Um, according to uh, DOD assessment, uh, by 2027, China might build uh, about 700 nuclear weapons. And by end of this decade, China might have uh, uh, more than 1,000 nuclear weapons. And, you know, of course, that assessment uh, is um, hard to, uh, you, know, to uh, you know, to be certain, uh, given the huge uh, secrecy over Chinese nuclear program. Um, there are other uh, estimates uh, available in the public domain as well. A, a Japanese source, for example, uh, puts the number of Chinese nuclear arsenal uh, at uh, by 2035 at about 900 nuclear weapons, which is a smaller number compared with the American uh, official assessment, but still uh, uh, it would represent a huge increase of China's traditionally small uh, nuclear capability. Um, and it's j j not just that China is increasing uh, the number of its silo-based ICBM forces, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, which were revealed by commercial satellite imagery uh, a few years ago um, uh, by uh, foreign uh, researchers, uh, but also China is openly developing a nuclear triad capability, uh, meaning uh, land-based, sea-based, and air-based uh, nuclear systems, which is a major departure from its traditionally heavy uh, reliance on land-based nuclear forces. Uh, and the official narrative uh, regarding its nuclear uh, weapons uh, has been changing for many years. The official language was China is to maintain a lean and effective nuclear force. But in recent years, that language has um, been replaced by uh, something like uh, the need to develop a high-level strategic deterrent system and the most recent language is China is going to build a powerful uh, strategic deterrent capabilities system. Uh, that's, I think, very different from the lean and effective uh, language. Um, 
So there are apparently technical level drivers uh, behind China's nuclear modernization uh, for, for decades. Uh, China uh, has been worried that uh, non-nuclear military technologies possessed by the United States uh, may um, uh, gradually undermine the uh, survivability of China's nuclear second strike capability, and China needs to uh, um, conduct qualitative uh, modernization to compensate for that threat. Uh, you know, the non-nuclear technology that China has been worried uh, include uh, missile defense, uh, conventional precision strike weapons, uh, advanced uh, sensors based in space that can track and um, trail Chinese uh, mobile nuclear uh, launch systems. Uh, even cyber technology, in theory, can be used to interfere with China's nuclear command control system. Uh, and among all these technologies, missile defense has been China's primary concern. China worried that the U.S. might launch a comprehensive nuclear disarming first strike and then use its missile defense system to uh, um, intercept any uh, survived uh, Chinese uh, retaliating warheads. Um, the demise of the INF Treaty, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, in 2019 further increases the Chinese concern that the termination of the treaty may open up opportunity for the U.S. to deploy conventional land-based uh, counterforce strike capabilities near China. Um, so uh, these have all been Chinese concerns at the technical level. However, um, I don't think the technical level factors are the main uh, factors driving current Chinese nuclear buildup. Um, you know, there is no uh, rapid and abrupt improvement of American nuclear or missile defense capabilities. And Chinese officials, they are not really uh, pointing at American missile defense um, as the uh, reason uh, for China's current nuclear expansion. And also, very tellingly, many Chinese nuclear policy experts, including civilian and military experts, they don't appear to understand why uh, China uh, has a military need uh, to massively expand its nuclear forces. Um, so I uh, tend to think that the political level consideration is a more important uh, driver of current Chinese nuclear expansion, um, especially um, the Chinese paramount leader, Mr. Xi Jinping, has been really emphasizing uh, the fact that uh, there are going to be profound changes uh, unseen in hundreds of years in the foreseeable future in terms of the development of global uh, geostrategic situation. Um, and from the, you know, if we read the statements and speeches uh, and writings by Chinese senior uh, political leaders, especially Mr. Xi, we get this idea that he thinks that the reason there are increasing troubles between China and the US-led Western countries in recent years uh, is uh, because of the uh, structural change in the international balance of power, meaning that China's continuous uh, success to develop uh, is um, um, making it more likely uh, over time that China might achieve this power transition between U.S. and China. Uh, and that really threatens the United States because the United States wants to preserve its, pre its predominance in, in the international system. Uh, so from this perspective, from the view of the Chinese top leadership, they think um, the U.S. therefore starts to use all sorts of uh, desperate and extreme measures, inclu including political attack on the Chinese ruling party to make up disinformation, uh, to use you know, uh, made-up excuses on human rights, on, on Xinjiang, Uyghurs. They think all, all of these political uh, uh, criticisms against China are made up disinformation, uh, simply to demonize China and create trouble for China to uh, avoid, uh, uh, you know, to slow down China's growth, to make it harder for China to make friends, to increase in its international influence. So they attribute all the troubles to uh, this uh, p uh, potential power transition, to the structural change in international balance of power. Um, so from this perspective, they think that it is useless to try to, uh, you know, 
resolve these disputes uh, through uh, dialogue because the U.S. is not really wanting, is not really concerned about any you know, human rights or Chinese uh, CCP uh, ruling. It is really about China challenging American uh, geopolitical predominance. So this power-centric mindset, uh, mindset leads to the Chinese uh, belief that in order to resolve this problem, China needs to further accelerate this power transition. Uh, so by the time China can build and demonstrate very strong strategic capability, that's when the U.S. and U.S.-led Western countries would eventually be forced to accept China's rights and to treat China with equality and respect. That's why I think they're putting so much resources into a comprehensive military modernization and especially uh, the expansion of nuclear power because nuclear weapons are the ultimate demonstration of strategic capability, and they have the greatest psychological impact on the Chinese rivals about how they understand international balance of power. And because there is such a strong top-level political mandate right now in China to further expand and build up China's nuclear uh, capability, um, there is very little um, uh, pushback. Uh, from the operational level players, uh, because under China's increasingly centralized domestic political system, there, you know, uh, political loyalty is, emphasi is emphasized more than anything else. It's really hard for operational level, for the bureaucracies, uh, uh, for the bureaucratic officials to push back against the top leader's uh, desire. Um, so there's very little uh, uh, reflection, very little debate, very little uh, pushback uh, within the Chinese system. Uh, everyone is so uh, determined and so convinced about this need to massively expand Chinese nuclear forces. That makes the arms race uh, risk uh, much harder uh, than in previous uh, years. Uh, and as China is so focused on building up its nuclear capabilities, there's less attention paid uh, to how these new capabilities, how these new nuclear postures might increase uh, chances of misunderstanding in a crisis. Uh, so there is growing interest in rapid uh, re response capabilities of Chinese nuclear forces. There is increasing interest in building early warning technology and uh, adopt uh, a launch and attack nuclear posture. Uh, so all of these uh, developments also make uh, future uh, uh, crisis escalation risk greater than before. Um, and the risk, uh, uh, the nuclear, uh, the risk of nuclear conflict is uh, uh, greatest uh, over uh, the Taiwan Strait um, um, region um, because there are serious uh, mutual misunderstandings uh, between U.S. and China on the Taiwan issue, for example. The two sides genuinely disagree about who wants to initiate a war over Taiwan. The Americans that are looking at China's nuclear buildup, China's conventional military buildup, uh, China's diversifying of nuclear capabilities, China's development of uh, precision theater range nuclear forces, and they think, look, China is doing all this because China might want to threaten nuclear use in a conventional war over Taiwan Strait if China faces conventional defeat in the future. Whereas China is looking at the United States and China thinks it's the United States who wants to provoke a war over the Taiwan Strait and then use the war to weaken China, just like uh, the U.S. is provoking a war over Ukraine and, and then using the Ukraine war to weaken Russia. That's how Chinese leadership and Chinese experts are understanding the nature of the Ukraine war and how U.S. is using the, using the same logic to try to uh, uh, you know, provoke another war over Taiwan. And then the two sides genuinely disagree about who wants to initiate nuclear use uh, once a conventional war took place over Taiwan. Um, the U.S. is worried about you know, China's increasing theater range nuclear forces, uh, which means China has the capability to conduct or threaten limited nuclear use over Taiwan Strait. But China is looking at American, uh, you know, recent emphasis on low yield tactical nuclear capabilities. Uh, and they, their conclusion is the U.S. is deliberately lowering the threshold of nuclear use. Uh, and the uh, Chinese experts also recognize that the U.S. is losing its longstanding conventional military superiority in the Western Pacific region. And that increases American incentive to threaten nuclear escalation in a future conventional war. So uh, these, uh, you know, both sides believe it's the other side uh, who wants to uh, 
threaten or use nuclear weapons first. Uh, and that belief uh, in China is leading to growing Chinese interest in, de in developing nuclear escalation management capabilities, meaning that China is no longer satisfied with uh, you know, uh, a second strike capability against the US homeland. China wants now to have the capability to be able to respond to various types and scales of uh, regional nuclear attack and a limited nuclear attack. Uh, so we see China investing more in uh, uh, precision, uh, uh, precise uh, regional uh, nuclear capabilities, DF-21, DF-26, and DF-17, which is a, a, a hypersonic boost glider uh, missile that might be nuclear capable. And this is a major departure from China's traditional nuclear thinking. Um, uh, China used to think that nuclear escalation is very unlikely to happen. Um, but now China appears to be conduct uh, a, a more realistic uh, uh, nuclear war fighting uh, planning. So the Taiwan, uh, uh, the risk of a Taiwan conflict is pushing the nuclear issue much closer uh, to the forefront of the US-China security relationship. And of course, despite China's interest to expand its nuclear forces, uh, one major bottleneck is whether China has enough fissile material to actually uh, build so many additional nuclear uh, warheads. Um, there is recent uh, news reporting about uh, uh, China's uh, construction of uh, two um, demonstration fast reactors uh, in Fujian province. Um, and, uh, the, the suspicion is China might, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, use its civilian uh, reprocessing facility, uh, which China is also building in recent years, to extract weapons-grade plutonium from the uh, blanket materials in the fast reactors, uh, and then use those plutonium to build more bombs. Uh, it is, you know, China has said uh, very little about uh, about these reactors, about its uh, civilian reprocessing uh, capability, but there is uh, circumstantial uh, evidence that this may be possible uh, because uh, the two fast reactors uh, have been managed by um, uh, China's uh, state administration for uh, science, technology, and industry for national defense, and uh, have the reactors have been referred in official sources as part of China's civil military fusion program. Um, and after China's civilian uh, pilot reprocessing plant started to, operating, to operate uh, in 2016, uh, China start, stopped reporting its plutonium uh, stockpile to IAEA uh, the next year and has not resumed reporting uh, 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 so far. Um, and China is further building uh, another larger scale uh, demonstration reprocessing facility uh, in uh, inner China, uh, uh, Gansu province. Um, and last year in the 2020 NPT review conference, uh, the Chinese delegation made great efforts to make sure that the language that calls for a moratorium on fissile material production is removed from the draft final document from the review conference. Um, so. All of these raise international suspicion, but of course, there is no, it's hard to make definitive uh, conclusion. It is also possible that China may be building uh, dedicated uh, military uh, reactors for uh, producing fissile materials. But in either case, the uh, overall opacity uh, and secrecy over these uh, dual use uh, facilities is creating a lot of uh, threat perception in foreign countries. So what is the implication for China's nuclear, uh, for, uh, of all this uh, for China's uh, nuclear arms control and disarmament policy? Um, because of the uh, power century mindset that uh, uh, um, makes China believe that uh, it should use the time to focus on building up its uh, nuclear capabilities uh, rather than uh, reducing or uh, 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 constraining its nuclear development, there's very little political interest in China to discuss anything about uh, nuclear arms control. Uh, the entire focus is on, uh, on uh, development. Uh, you can uh, feel that uh, uh, mindset very strongly by uh, following the uh, discussion of Chinese experts on this issue. Um, 
And some Chinese uh, uh, diplom senior diplomats uh, declared that it would make no sense for China to consider nuclear arms control unless uh, there is nuclear parity between China and United States. Um, if that's the official Chinese standard for joining future nuclear arms control, then that would be a major change from China's previous uh, declaratory policy. Because in the 1980s, uh, China officially declared that it would join the major powers in nuclear arms control negotiation if U.S. and Soviet Union were to cut their nuclear arsenals by half. And that had already happened, uh, but China didn't join and, and is, now, uh, appears, uh, is now appearing to announce a, a, higher, uh, a higher bar uh, for joint arms control negotiation. Um, so uh, very little interest on arms control. And on disarmament, uh, China used to be a very strong proponent, uh, pro promoter of uh, nuclear disarmament. Actually, in 1963, one year before China's first nuclear detonation, the Chinese government made a very high-level, high-profile uh, 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 announcement that uh, all the countries should convene an international summit uh, on the issue of eliminating uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, in fact, that happened in 2017, which is the uh, negotiation of the TPNW Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, but China refused to participate. Um, and uh, again, if, we, if you follow domestic uh, discussions, there is very strong feeling in the Chinese policy community today that it is totally unrealistic to think about a nuclear disarmament today. Um, the only uh, platform, international platform, that China indicates some interest uh, uh, at which to discuss the issue of disarmament is the P5 process. Uh, there is this process among the five official nuclear weapon states to, uh, within, uh, among themselves to discuss issues related to nuclear arms control and disarmament. Uh, but in the P5 process, um, you know, due to the lack of uh, uh, capability of the rest of the international community to put real pressure, there is not much substantive discussion on uh, disarmament issues. They have talked about nuclear doctrines, they have talked about how new technologies might affect uh, nuclear stability, but uh, they are barely scratch, scratching the surface of substantive arms control dis disarmament issues. Uh, so there is not much happening uh, at P5 process, but that's the only uh, platform that Chinese officials uh, are willing to uh, participate. And Russia. Russia is a country that has been really influencing Chinese nuclear thinking in recent uh, decades. Um, for example, uh, as uh, China watches the Russian uh, uh, nuclear saber rattling during the Ukraine war, uh, China is largely sympathetic uh, to the Russian thinking. Uh, again, China genuinely believe that the Ukraine war was provoked uh, by Western countries and Russia is forced to defend its legitimate interests. And therefore, uh, China is sympathetic in the sense that uh, they think it is uh, understandable that Russia wants to rely on its remaining uh, military advantage, i.e. nuclear weapons, to defend its core national interests. Um, 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 and um, that said, um, uh, China is also worried that uh, you know, the, the Ukraine war might actually escalate across the nuclear threshold, and that would be very much against Chinese uh, interests. Uh, so China disagrees with Russia about uh, actual uh, deploy, uh, employment of nuclear weapons, uh, and we have seen some official Chinese um, statements uh, to that effect. Um, however, because of the fundamental uh, Chinese belief that uh, China and Russia share uh, a, a common cause in pushing back against so-called you know, hegemonic uh, uh, US and Western um, uh, influence. And um, uh, the uh, uh, you know, two countries are both deeply worried about their regime security and political security. Uh, and they think Western countries, their political system, uh, pose the greatest threat uh, to their uh, regime and political security. Uh, so that provides the most uh, important foundation for a deeper and broader bilateral strategic cooperation. We have seen both countries moving uh, 
uh, towards greater uh, uh, strategic military and, uh, and military uh, and, and nuclear cooperation. Uh, they have been conducting more frequent joint uh, patrols by uh, strategic bombers. Russia has been helping China in developing its missile defense capability and early warning technologies. Uh, there might be future possibilities for even uh, closer nuclear cooperation after the AUKUS nuclear uh, uh, cooperation agreement between UK, US, and uh, Australia. That might um, make uh, uh, Russia and China uh, less reluctant to uh, cooperate on uh, nuclear uh, submarine technologies uh, between themselves. Um, after Mr. Xi's recent visit to Russia, uh, there may be a discussion about um, uh, even uh, uh, closer uh, coordination between the two countries uh, on strategic military issues. Uh, and that creates uh, a very negative impact from the American perspective because the US believe that it now needs to deal with two nuclear peer, uh, near peer competitors at the same time. And that is motivating the United States to think about further expanding its own nuclear capabilities. Um, so that has a very negative ripple uh, effect to the stability of uh, international nuclear regime. And DPRK is another uh, nuclear capable country that is expanding its nuclear uh, capabilities very quickly. It is simultaneously developing strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and a few uh, uh, regional arms race uh, in East Asia. Uh, it, uh, it is also uh, making South Korea and Japan more uh, interested in seeking uh, hedging options, including uh, uh, broader discussions uh, within these countries about uh, uh, relying more on American extended nuclear deterrence and uh, more discussions about developing indigenous nuclear capabilities of their own. China, however, uh, thinks that the North Korean problem is uh, primarily um, uh, caused by uh, U.S. policy. Uh, it's the U.S. Uh, uh, activities in the region that are um, fueling uh, North Korea's nuclear uh, pursuit. Uh, and China also is, is sympathetic to North Korea in the sense that the, uh, China thinks uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons are only to uh, protect its uh, regime security and national security. And there is no way North Korea would offensively uh, threaten nuclear weapons to attack its neighbors. So US allies like South Korea and Japan shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't feel threatened. Um, and China also uh, thinks that it's the United States that is undermining global non-proliferation regime by relaxing South Korea's uh, uh, capability, uh, uh, relaxing South Korea's uh, uh, constraints in developing uh, missile technologies, in promoting the AUKUS uh, submarine agreement, and, in, uh, with, uh, and by withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, JCPOA. So China has a very different view about who is causing problem to international and regional non-proliferation regime. As a result, uh, as China thinks it's, it's the United States that is, that is making trouble and is um, uh, prioritizing its own geopolitical interests over non-proliferation principles, why should China um, place non-proliferation norms at higher uh, order than its own geopolitical interests? So both countries uh, think uh, it's time to focus on one's own interests over non-proliferation norms, and, and that has a very detrimental uh, effect. So given the very uh, uh, gloomy picture I'm painting, um, I want to end uh, with some uh, positive suggestions on what uh, scholars and scientists uh, like us uh, may be able to help mitigate uh, this problem, if not to resolve this problem. But first, uh, th this problem is fundamentally a political problem. Uh, the reason China has very different perceptions about who is causing trouble, uh, what's the source of international stability, is fundam fundamentally because of China becoming an increasingly closed society, which uh, is you know, ruled by a very uh, centralized uh, decision-making system. The top leadership enjoys absolute worship and authority. Uh, there's very little internal checks and balances. 
that even the Chinese own nuclear policy experts are very much uh, marginalized uh, in China's uh, nuclear decision uh, deliberation and making. Um, the information gap uh, between the Chinese society and the Western society is a main cause of this uh, overall perception gap. And that's the fundamental driver of China-Western confrontation and is a fundamental driver of China's nuclear buildup um, and the increasing risk of nuclear arms race uh, between US and China. Um, it's a political problem. I don't think we have the power to really resolve that. But we can still work to recognize that fundamental challenge and try to promote open society as the most important way to reduce this fundamental threat. Um, at the operational level, uh, I think the policy experts, uh, some, of, some of you uh, uh, working on policy issues, it might be useful to start a more serious debate here about no first use, um, because that's the only issue that China wants to discuss. I think China is genuinely uh, convinced that no first use is the you know, most uh, useful first step towards reducing nuclear tensions. The uh, US has been resisting such discussions, um, uh, mostly because of concerns from American allies. Um, but I think given the growing risk of a Taiwan Strait conflict and the risk of nuclear escalation in that conflict, uh, maybe it is time to have a serious discussion about U.S.-China bilateral no first use agreement over the Taiwan Strait. Uh, this geographically limited no first use agreement may reduce the concern of U.S. allies and may deserve a serious discussion. Uh, we may also want to raise awareness of the consequences of, of a nuclear conflict. There is a recent study by my colleague at Princeton, uh, Sebastian Philipp, who is looking at the Chinese uh, silo, uh, ICBM silo uh, basis, and his calculation shows that uh, if there is a nuclear exchange, uh, the nuclear fallout uh, from uh, American attack on the Chinese massive nuclear silo sites would kill uh, uh, millions, uh, if not uh, actually, I think, uh, tens of millions of China's own civilians, including uh, people in Beijing and Shanghai and other major uh, cities. Uh, so there is very little internal Chinese discussion on these consequences of nuclear conflict. Uh, maybe we may uh, 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 use research uh, uh, to raise uh, public awareness uh, to increase, uh, to promote domestic uh, policy deliberation. And lastly, uh, we may want to really empower Chinese experts. Again, this is a system that is becoming increasingly centralized and increasingly seclusive. Experts are increasingly uh, um, uh, excluded from, from internal discussion. Um, but we, if we want to promote uh, you know, accountable decision making in China, we need to uh, empower the Chinese experts. Um, we, you know, we can, uh, you know, through expert level dialogues, we may be able to reduce some of the bilateral misunderstandings I uh, mentioned uh, before. Uh, and uh, we may be able to build capacity within the Chinese policy community to address their traditional suspicion about arms control, about verification, and to convince them that this can work. And then they uh, would be, I think, uh, a useful uh, internal force to um, uh, promote arms control uh, within the Chinese society and to uh, influence the Chinese uh, top uh, political leaders uh, and to gradually change uh, China's nuclear policy making. Uh, let me stop here and uh, open up for uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go ahead and take uh, a couple of questions uh, for Dr. Zhao, and then afterwards we'll open it up for uh, questions for the entire panel. Please. Thank you very much. I had not heard this about China before. So you mentioned that um, ultimately the goal of the buildup of nuclear weapons for China is uh, dominance and respect. And I want to know what those things are from the Chinese point of view. Dominance, it, I would imagine it meant economic dominance, which it's getting anyway, which doesn't need nuclear weapons for that. And respect, what is that to the Chinese? What does that actually mean? Um, uh, let's go there. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. The, the reason that um, the U.S. Is, is dominant is people want to be here. When you look at the refugees around the world, they're not running to Russia and China. They're coming here. So how does China see that as part of respect and dominance? Um, I don't think China sees itself as pursuing dominance. Again, the Chinese per, per, perception is it's the U.S. that is uh, being aggressive uh, and is uh, threatening Chinese core interests and um, is uh, uh, using you know, all the disinformation to demonize China. So you know, it, it, it is all the nuclear buildup is actually very closely connected to that perception. Um, Again, that's that's a much higher level problem. I don't think you know we can be uh, you know we can resolve them anytime soon. But it's a problem I think uh, arises mostly from China's domestic situation. Again, if you if you have visited China before, you would uh, be able to tell that China has become a very different country in recent years. Um, and I think that's the core issue we need to address. Um, so let me, let me stop here um, because of time limited, but I'm happy to discuss more offline. Okay, yeah, please. Um, I have two questions. First is, um, you said the U.S. is resistant to a no first use policy because of our allies. Could you say more about that, why they have that feeling? Sure. Um, so it's basically um, for the U.S. nuclear umbrella to its allies to be credible, in theory, um, that works against a uh, U.S.-China uh, mutual nuclear destruction relationship. Because if there is U.S.-China mutual nuclear destruction relationship, uh, when China attacks U.S. allies, um, or even uses nuclear weapons against U.S. allies, the U.S. wouldn't be able to uh, retaliate with nuclear weapons on its allies' behalf because of the concern about Chinese nuclear retaliation against and U.S. homeland. That's what you mean by no first use, because in the NATO context, first use, you attack one, you attack all. So, you, you know, the, so there could be the, the equivalent response of no first use, not just against us, but against our coalition, right? Well, I mean, not, I mean in that regard, I mean, China already uh, declared, uh, you know, it will not use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states. So it, it, to China, it think it already made a promise of no, no nuclear use at all against U.S. allies. Um, okay, okay. okay so let's go ahead and uh, um, stop there. I'm sorry we're over time. Uh, let's bring the rest of the panel up to here so we can listen to the next questions. Anybody in questions for the rest of the panel? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. If I may just ask to the last speaker, thank you very much for the great and interesting talk. You several times mentioned that the Chinese leadership generally believes certain things which are very difficult to understand, that they really believe this, and it's not just talking points for a political opportunity, opportunistic position. And how can they really believe, for example, that uh, I don't know, the U.S. provoked the war in Ukraine or so. I mean, do they really believe this? Or is this a kind of misinformation or, or is it just to say we take this position to be in a better position for ourselves? Thank you. Just to be quick, um, I think it's, you know, if you look at Russia, Russian leaders and even the majority of Russian people, they, they seem to agree with the official Russian narrative. And if you think about that, in fact, the Chinese you know, systematic government efforts to manage information access within the Chinese society, to manage public opinion, the Chinese efforts have been in place for decades. And the Chinese policies are much stricter than the Russian policy for decades. That's why you know, the Chinese informa the information gap between China and the Western countries is actually a more a deeper problem, a, a bigger problem than the information and perception gap between Russia and Western societies. 
Right. So same, it's similar to Putin has very you know weird understandings of you know reality in the world. The same thing. They you know, they live in. You know they are the ones who use uh, public opinion and information management policies to shape the thinking of the public. But in fact, over time, when the public thinking is changed, the expert community's thinking is also changed, and then they come back to influence the leadership's own thinking. So it's an internal feedback loop that the leadership is not aware of. So maybe my question would be towards that. Um, what do you think would be needed to be done, in your opinion, to de-escalate the situation? I think my uh, my colleagues would also have uh, great insights on that issue. My my person my preliminary thinking is, um, you know, on the policy level, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the, the lack of interest is the fundamental obstacle. But as I said, we have to, given the constraints we face, we may have to uh, uh, promote efforts in the area where China is still interested in engaging. And on the nuclear policy issue, no first use appears to be the only thing that China wants to talk about. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm proposing some specific ideas of topics for the two sides to talk about. But for the broader public and scientific community, I think it's really important to promote open society in China and promote open scientific exchange and communication at all levels with the Chinese counterparts. That's the fundamental um, uh, way to help reduce the risk of military conflict. Yeah, I, I would uh, uh, join uh, Tung Zhao in that. And, and, and again, I would probably uh, try to return to uh, my point that uh, the uh, these kind of a missed opportunities or opportunity cost of uh, trying to solve uh, problems by relying on uh, confrontation and military confrontation in particular. Uh, I must say I'm, I have a few kind of a, uh, people in, uh, in my Twitter feed and it, it's really scary uh, the kind of a uh, the, the drive in the United States, and you see that the, the drive toward the uh, confrontation with China, and it's almost like, uh, I mean, it's a complicated process, but uh, for it's very clear for some people it is deliberate, uh, and some people have vested interest in doing that, and, and again, if you look at, back at the uh, uh, U.S. Soviet, the Cold War, uh, it, it didn't really, it didn't really uh, help any, anyone, and it brought us to into some very dangerous uh, quarters. So I think that that's the uh, one thing that we, we 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 all should try to do is to uh, try to see uh, what what can be done in terms of engagement, in terms of the mutual security, uh, and again, it's not. I'm not idealizing China. Uh, I'm not saying it's all benign, or but there things are can be done. And I would uh, I would strongly support the idea of kind of not first use. Uh, this is, uh, and in my view, that that's a very productive way of thinking about things. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. I'm looking at your last slide here. Empower Chinese experts. Do we know who they are? Are the your your our experts? I'm presuming the Arts Control Association knows who the Chinese experts are, and or you you'll let us know so we can be helpful. Because uh, I have no idea who they are. Thank you. Well, in the small nuclear policy community, uh, the, uh, the I think we, we we generally know who are the uh, Chinese uh, policy experts, and of course those who are willing and able to uh, talk with foreign counterparts 
are usually not included in domestic nuclear decision making process. But we need to start that engagement with, you know, we first talk to those who can talk to us, and then I think if they become more comfortable over time, there might be more Chinese experts who are you know, located, uh, uh, deep, situated deeper in Chinese bureaucracy, in the Chinese decision making process, may be able to uh, engage too. So it has to be a gradual process of mutual confidence building. Yep. Just maybe uh, something that um, uh, you, 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 you may be uh, aware of, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not related to the uh, Chinese uh, kind of nuclear policy experts, uh, but large, uh, to a larger uh, uh, scientific community, and I'm sure physics, uh, physics uh, community as well. Uh, I, the, the name of that initiative, I think it was called China Initiative, there was this uh, effort that was launched by the Trump administration, the FBI basically chasing down uh, uh, scientists who have contracts with, uh, uh, with China, with Chinese institutions and all that. Uh, I think, uh, again, I, I've read a couple of stories, accounts of that, uh, this process. I think there was one in Nature. And I must tell you that coming from my kind of Soviet Russian experience, that was uh, really, truly kind of a Russian FSB style campaign. Uh, so I, I think that that's something that uh, most of you can actually do just in your institutions, just to look at uh, uh, this kind of, uh, these kind of initiatives. I think that that particular was closed down at uh, some point, but certain elements remain uh, and uh, try to be kind of a voice of reason in your field to the extent that you know people and you know what they work and uh, try to again create the environment in which uh, the idea of free exchange between professionals in physics in particular uh, is more rather than something that is treated with suspicion. I think that that is very important and I think uh, it is uh, one element that uh, many many people can can do in their institutions. Thanks. Uh, so later this week, I will be um, introducing a film that's a drama about uh, nuclear Armageddon, and the name escapes me at the moment, but it is a, a drama. And I've been asked as a nuclear physicist to introduce this film. I have 10 minutes. What are the most important points that I can make? <laughs> oh man! Do you have more details on where the context, the location of this film? Uh, it's an art cinema in Tennessee, in Nashville, Tennessee. Or for the drama, where oh, the okay. drama takes no, place. If you give me one second, I'll give you the name. Of yeah, it. no problem. They'll hopefully help me spin up some suggestions. Ten minutes is not a lot of time. Don't tell me it's Oppenheimer, is it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> that joke is Thank you. Brea. Sorry, what was that? It takes place in La Brea. And hang on, I'm frantically looking. No, it's fine. I think if you have 10 minutes and it seems. Uh, I guess the suggestions that come to mind are first just emphasizing the effects. Oh, sorry. Miracle Mile. Miracle Mile. I don't know that one. Do you know that one? It's about ten months ago. A group of years ago, they sent out these anti-nuclear war and run along to try to save this girlfriend. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. So I would emphasize first um, something that I try to do when talking to audiences who don't, who aren't super familiar with the issues that we work on, is what the actual effects are of nuclear weapons. Um, so the Hibakusha in Japan, um, they're the atomic bomb survivors. 
There's Alex Wallerstein is a historian who I think would have a helpful blog and some rundowns for you on the um, kind of the experiences of the Habakkuk Shah, the dispute over how many people did perish in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think, Pavel, you had brought this up earlier as well about um, how influential the US use of nuclear weapons were in Japanese surrender. Alex has a very good piece kind of breaking down that argument. And so I think that can be helpful context when you're talking about a film where it seems like by the end of it, nuclear weapons are used. So then looking directly at an instance in our world that we saw the use of nuclear weapons. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's also, you know, I, I, I haven't seen the, the movie apparently. And I, uh, but uh, it would be interesting, uh, again, my uh, back to my point that uh, it is important to keep in mind uh, that uh, nuclear weapons are good only in one thing, is which is uh, killing a lot of people. So there is there is literally nothing else that they can do well. And I think it would be, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, the, as I understand, if it's a fictional uh, kind of scenario, maybe uh, there is something, but I think it would be interesting to look at what the uh, authors of the movie had in mind and challenge them if they uh, had some military mission in, in mind uh, or point out that the uh, actual effects. Uh, and, and it is, uh, again, as uh, uh, Shana mentioned, the, uh, it is uh, one, in my, in my, uh, in my life, there, there was this experience uh, that was very, uh, uh, was very visceral experience when you go and you visit the, the museum in Hiroshima. Uh, that was, you, you can see actually that uh, the damage, I mean, b basically most concrete structures actually survived. So the only, so the, uh, but the, if you compare the physical damage with the, uh, with the loss of life and suffering, it just, it's a totally different scale. So, and I think that that's that's a, that's an important message to bring people, uh, uh, to bring and tell people that pay pay attention to that, even if they. Yeah. So I had to comment, and then uh, kind of a comment question. So, um, I was uh, one of two young scientists who were sent by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences to the Soviet Union. At, the very beginning of the 1970s as a sort of precursor effort to begin for the first time to have exchanges of physicists between the United States and the Soviet Union. And I think that that flowered and I think it had a huge positive impact. And it was not only our contacts with physicists not involved in the nuclear weapons program or those kind of considerations, but many of the people who, for example, were leaders in astrophysics or other areas of physics in the Soviet Union also were advisors. And so you actually had a direct connection, even though the, the avowed reason for the contact you know, was pure physics in a way. So I, I think that turned out to be very successful. In my case, it uh, eventually led to my having a relationship with Yevgeny Velikov and various other people who eventually became advisors to Gorbachev and so on. Not that I you know, had a huge role, but for example, I remember having an argument with Yevgeny about the Krasnoyarsk radar. And I think um, he, he may have or may not, but he acted as though he didn't really understand the psychological um, significance of that because he was very clear about the technical aspects that weren't threatening, um, but for whatever reason, you know, about three or four weeks later, Gorbachev announced that they were going to dismantle it. So I don't think I played a role in that, but it was interesting to see um, that kind of interaction. So I, I strongly encourage people to do that kind of, of visits and connections. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about the no first use, and my strong impression is that it's not very thoughtful that countries who feel they need the umbrella 
many people there haven't thought very carefully about it. And the reason I think that is because when I ask them, suppose you know, such a city, name one, in your country was attacked, um, or maybe some military force was there, would you want the US to explode a nuclear weapon on your city to destroy those forces? Or would you want the US to be the first to use a nuclear weapon against the invading country? Would that end well for you? And they act like they haven't thought about it. So I would just encourage people, I mean, think what you, Pablo, are saying really needs some deep thinking rather than being reacting at a fairly superficial level. Just a brief, yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, this, uh, this, that was a very good point about the uh, contacts and the value. There is, uh, there is absolutely no, no doubt about that. Yeah, even, even, if, even if you don't talk to uh, someone who has an ear of the leadership, uh, it is important to, uh, to create uh, these uh, 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 channels of communication and sort of understand each other because as I think Tom Zhao mentioned that the, uh, there is a gap in perception on uh, on the on the on the on this uh, first use uh, i mean a i must admit I, I know that this is the uh, argument that always uh, comes up that oh the us allies are always against this no first use pledge i've never understood the logic of that that's uh, and I, I just mentioned uh, to to mention uh, there there are actually uh, there, there 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 was work done there were uh, uh, people who did um, uh, opinion polls and surveys uh, uh, in places like uh, South Korea and Japan, specifically asking about this uh, first use. And, and their conclusion was that people actually do feel that th this is not kind of responding by nuclear uh, strike is not a good policy. <laughs> so. Stephen Herzog, uh, that, that was the uh, name of the person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always wanted to be that <laughs> So I was just doing a little bit of Googling during the last talk, and I found a question that I thought might be relevant here. It was published on the Rand Corporation. I hope that's not too biased. But it says, Washington's current policy is one of strategic ambiguity deliberately creating uncertainty in Beijing and Taipei to keep all parties guessing whether and to what extent the US military, military will intervene in a war across the strait. And then in, the article goes on to ask, is that still the appropriate strategy to deter Beijing? Basically, the ambiguity policy's logic is um, you know, the U.S. Uh, would keep it open at the official level whether it would send military would militarily defend Taiwan if, if China attacked. Um, the thinking is if you know uh, a more explicit commitment would help deter China, uh, but an explicit commitment would also run the risk of. Uh, enraging China, making China believe that U.S. supports Taiwan independence, and that could actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy and makes Chinese invasion even more likely. Um, I think it really depends on whether you know, China is you know, uh, apparently preparing to attack. Right? If there is an imminent risk of Chinese attack, maybe a more explicit commitment to that effect from the United States would make sense. But if the Chinese are still making decisions and evaluations, maybe some ambiguity would help strike the right balance and avoid, you know, uh, avoid Chinese overreaction. Okay. Well, there's no other comments. Well, we'd like to thank our <laughs>